All right. Well, here we are at uh, Toxicology Part 2, and um, we're going to pick up with, uh, you know, maybe some tail end of some familiar poisonings and then get into some uh, poisonings we don't see much of and then cover things like bites and stings. Um, as far as alcohols, uh, one of the first alcohols that we would like to talk about are protoxins. Um, they are processed by the body to form toxins. Uh, and they include ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is uh, antifreeze um, and uh, methanol. So when you uh, overdose on antifreeze or methanol, um, protoxins are formed uh, as part of that um, process. Uh, as far as ethanol, ETOH, uh, signs and symptoms of ethanol toxicity, and we've all had that patient that's had a little too much to drink, uh, may begin with euphoria, inebriation, confusion, lethargy, and alcohol by virtue as a CNS depressant, uh, may cause ataxia, death, uh, stupor, respiratory depression, uh, hypothermia if uh, left out in the elements, hypotension, coma, and uh, cardiac arrest. Treatment for alcohol poisoning <coughs> is supportive. We have to manage the ABCs, uh, be alert for uh, vomiting, uh, gain IV access. Um, uh, the metabolism of, of alcohol does um, uh, consume quite a bit of uh, water uh, in order for that to happen. So uh, giving them a fluid bolus certainly would uh, uh, you know, be beneficial. Uh, ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, it's got a very sweet taste uh, because it is sweet. It certainly could be ingested by children. Uh, because it is toxic, um, some uh, people, not so nice people, uh, will put it in bowls uh, in their garages and around the yard if they're trying to kill uh, particular pets. Um, with uh, ingestion of ethylene glycol, we don't see that as a form of suicide much anymore. And uh, back in the day, antifreeze stayed um, unfrozen because it had a high alcohol content. So uh, alcoholics would uh, strain the antifreeze through bread and um, uh, get uh, most of the alcohol. But now uh, ethylene glycol does not contain um, ethanol and so uh, uh, that ingestion is, is not something that's common. It's more accidental because of its sweet taste. Uh, hypocalcemia and cardiac dysrhythmias can result uh, from ingesting uh, antifreeze, severe joint pains, and then liver and kidney damage. Signs and symptoms of ethylene glycol ingestion include intoxication, headaches, CNS depression, respiratory difficulty, metabolic acidosis, cardiovascular collapse, renal failure, seizures, and coma. So very similar to ETOH in ingestion. Treatment is going to be supportive, but there is an antidote for ethanol. Um, it's a cofactor therapy with uh, pyridoxine and thiamine. Um, so administering those two drugs together uh, uh, help uh, reverse the effects of ethylene glycol. Methanol is what you might find in windshield wiper solvent. Uh, it's also found in uh, gasoline treatment. Uh, it's found in paint. It's found in sterno. So it is a hydrocarbon solvent. Uh, it can be absorbed through the skin. It can be inhaled. It can be ingested. Uh, it metabolizes into formaldehyde, uh, which converts to formic acid. And of course, you could imagine with acids being produced in excess in your body that metabolic acidosis would uh, certainly be a consequence of ingesting this. Signs and symptoms include sedation, ataxia, headache, vertigo, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, respiratory difficulty, blurred vision, seizures and coma. Treatment is going to be supportive as well um, and uh, maintaining their ABCs and there is an antidote um, for methanol and that is co-effector therapy with uh, folic acid. Uh, iso isopropanol is a uh, rubbing alcohol and uh, when ingested it metabolizes into acetone so it causes uh, acetonemia uh, and ketonuria so you get um, 
you get acetones in your blood, which is going to lead to metabolic acidosis, and you get ketones spilling out in your urine. Um, <coughs> again, rubbing alcohol um, was at one time thought uh, by uh, alcoholics to, uh, because it is alcohol, that they could drink it and uh, get the same sort of effect they would with uh, ethanol. Uh, but it, with the uh, uh, metabolizing into acetone, uh, leading to metabolic acidosis and spilling of ketones in the urine, um, uh, they found out quick that's just not something you can drink. Signs and symptoms include confusion, uh, lethargy, CNS depression, respiratory depression, uh, ketonemia, uh, mild hypothermia, uh, hypotension, and coma. And uh, they may have that fruity odor on their breath, much like you'd see with diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, because during diabetic ketoacidosis, there's a lot of ketones in the blood, and there would be a lot of ketones in the blood with this as well. Treatment is going to be supportive. Uh, maintain uh, their airway, breathing, and circulation, gain IV access. Um, depending on the severity of the um, ingestion, they may need emergent hemodialysis in a hospital capable of providing that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, poisonings by metals and heavy metals. Uh, iron. Uh, iron uh, is a, a supplement that's necessary. Uh, it helps us... Um, keep our hemoglobin strong and uh, allowing it to um, uh, carry oxygen. Um, and it's found in many vitamin formulations. Uh, with children under six years of age, um, it's most uh, common in uh, poisonings are most common in children under six. Uh, when the dose is uh, greater than 20 milligrams per kilo, uh, that's uh, considered a lethal dose, so you have to determine the amount uh, of overdose. Uh, iron is very toxic to the stomach lining. Um, it uh, forms uh, concretions or bezoars in the GI tract, and um, with a significant ingestion, iron poisoning will lead to cardiovascular collapse and death within 12 to 48 hours. Lead and mercury are found, lead particularly found in older buildings in the lead paint. Mercury can be found in the fluorescent bulbs, mercury thermometers, thermostats, electronics, and in cars. Um, uh, Long-term exposure to, uh, you know, lead paint, kids eating uh, lead paint chips, um, being exposed to the um, mercury fumes um, lead to neurologic deficits. The phrase, uh, mad as a hatter, uh, comes from the fact that uh, back in the day uh, when making hats, they would soak them in mercury and uh, that would allow them to uh, shape them. Uh, but when soaking them in mercury, they were constantly breathing in the mercury fumes and became delirious over time. Treatment is supportive, and then chelating agents. Uh, chelating agents bind with these metals and help uh, remove them from the body. Uh, arsenic is another metal. Um, it comes in three oxidation states, and it leads to toxicologic effects. It's naturally found in groundwater, and uh, I remember quite frequently in the uh, 70s and 80s in farms that um, you know, didn't have rural water and they had their own wells that uh, occasionally the well water needed to be tested to make sure that they didn't have high concentrations of arsenic. Um, it's also found in treated lumber decks uh, and in CCA treated wood. Um, it's also found in electronics. Um, uh, PC processors uh, may contain some arsenic. Uh, it is an inhalation hazard if breathed in. Signs and symptoms, acute GI illness, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, dehydration, severe anemia, lethargy, and renal failure. Treatment is supportive and, again, chelating agents. So you can see with some of these poisonings as we get, uh, you know, into um, the more or less common like arsenic and lead and mercury and those sort of things that uh, treatment's going to be specifically uh, supportive, managing the ABCs. Uh, and then um, uh, determining which chelating agents uh, need to be um, 
given to the patient that would bind with these metals and help remove them from the body. Uh, as far as wildlife poisonings, probably um, the most common um, wildlife poisoning is going to be an in insect sting or a bite, uh, with honeybees being um, the most common. And signs and symptoms of a honeybee envenomation include local pain and itching, uh, swelling and edema. It can cause anaphylactic shock, headache, weakness, nausea, vomiting, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and renal failure. Uh, certainly the respiratory distress, failure, and renal failure are tied in with the anaphylactic shock. Uh, treatment is to uh, be supportive of the airway, breathing, and circulation. Rapid removal of a stinger because uh, you know when the stinger is injected into the body and the bee flies away, the stinger is left in the body uh, with a little venom sac on the end of it, so it continues to pump the venom into the into the um, into the patient until gone. Uh, so using a credit card or something uh, sharp like that, uh, you know, quickly. Um, uh, rub it over the site to remove the stinger or if you have a pair of tweezers uh, uh, pull the stinger out if it's not already been removed. Uh, apply a cold pack, uh, get a good history including allergies. If they're in a lot of pain certainly analgesics would work especially if they've had multiple um, stings. Uh, watch for anaphylactic shock. Um, so, you know, gain IV access. Should they develop signs of anaphylactic shock, then we're looking at things like uh, epinephrine, somewhere between uh, 0.3 and 0.5 milligrams IM. Uh, and uh, then you'd consider things like Benadryl, uh, might consider something like an H2 blocker, um, uh, steroids, uh, those sort of things for anaphylaxis. And then rapid transport. Wasps, yellow jackets, and fire ants, um, very similar signs and symptoms, actually the, the exact same signs and symptoms as uh, honeybees, um, with local pain and itching, swelling and edema, headache and weakness, nausea and vomiting, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, renal failure, and the potential for anaphylaxis. Treatment is going to be the same as uh, it was for honeybees. Uh, you know, remove the stinger if possible. Uh, you won't see that with fire ants, but certainly with wasps and yellow jackets you may. Uh, put some cold compress on the site to get a good history to make sure they're not allergic. Uh, have uh, epinephrine, uh, Benadryl, and uh, steroids and an H2 blocker standing by uh, in the event that they do develop anaphylaxis. And then give them, if they're in a lot of pain, particularly with multiple stings, uh, analgesics would be would be appropriate. Um, you know, it's important that we understand that uh, in making the decision to treat a patient for anaphylaxis that we don't um, mistreat them. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we'll see in, in services that carry EpiPens that if they've got a person who's having an allergic reaction, uh, in other words, they're... Um, their skin may be itchy, they may develop hives, their nose may be running, their eyes watering, um, and then they, they give them an EpiPen. Um, when in fact, uh, you know, EpiPens are not given for a standard allergy, uh, Benadryl would be, but not an EpiPen. Epi's given only in cases of systemic anaphylaxis. Um, so the patient would have to be exhibiting signs and symptoms of some sort of systemic involvement or uh, stages of shock, uh, in which case we would give them the, um, the epinephrine. Uh, spiders, scorpions, and ticks are arach arachnoids. Um, the black widow spider, um, not uh, around here. The temperatures are too extreme. Um, if they do uh, show up around here, it might be uh, if somebody moved um, from a warmer location to here, um, <coughs> they'll have uh, severe pain at the bite site, swelling at the bite site, uh, goosebumps, um, which is what you call piloerections, uh, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypertension, uh, fever, uh, hyperthermia, muscle spasms, and abdominal pain. Um, you can identify the black widow spider because of the um, the hourglass on the belly uh, of the uh, female. Um, treatment is going to be supportive. Get a good history. Try to ID the spider. Uh, 
you could put some cold compress to the bite site uh, and then monitor, um, uh, you know, heart rate, uh, vital signs, temperature, uh, pulse oximetry, end tidal CO2, all those things could be monitored. Because um, <clears throat> not everybody's going to respond the same way uh, when envenomated by a, a female uh, black widow. Brown recluse spiders, those are something that uh, we may have in, in uh, some parts of Iowa, particularly in warmer parts. Um, signs and symptoms include uh, itchiness at the site, um, swelling, uh, the formation over time of a papule, uh, which is like a big pimple, um, a, narcot a necrotic lesion evolves. Uh, bullseyes, rash, uh, systemic fever and cheer, chills, malaise and weakness, nausea and vomiting, seizures, hypotension, and in, in worst case scenario, DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation where um, the patient's unable to clot. Um, the brown recluse uh, is... Um, uh, brown as you can see in the picture there and it's found in uh, you know dark areas uh, shaded areas under porches uh, buried in wood piles uh, you know those sort of things where um, they're typically not seen out running around um, and the wounds from these bites uh, can evolve to being just just horrific um, depending on the amount of envenomation so treatment is going to be supportive, get a good history, try to ID the spider if possible, um, establish an IV, give a fluid bolus. Um, here's an example of a, a brown recluse um, spider bite where initially it, it might be uh, just the bullseye rash and then necrotic and uh, here it's on the healing side. Um, but that necrotic tissue um, Will probably all die and slough off and and um, that can be a significant amount and be deep all the way to the bone uh, leaving permanent uh, scars. Uh, scorpions, there's more than 600 species of scorpions in the United States and only the bark scorpion is dangerous to human beings and um, uh, that's, that's interesting because um, uh, the bark scorpion is not found anywhere around here. I know when you get out to western Nebraska uh, and certainly into Colorado that you start to see some species of scorpions, but um, those uh, are not dangerous to humans. It hurts when you're stung with a whip, um, but uh, they're not dangerous. Uh, bark or sculptured scorpions, uh, they're going to have mild uh, uh, local local pain uh, at the sting. Uh, they can develop pulmonary edema, have neuromotor hyperactivity and respiratory distress from the pulmonary edema. Uh, if they've been bit by a scorpion and certainly they're showing signs and symptoms of, of uh, pulmonary edema and those sort of things, then um, you know, treatment's going to be supportive, uh, managing uh, any life threats in the ABCs. Uh, administering some oxygen, putting cold compact, uh, cold compress uh, to the bite site. Um, you know, we don't in any of these bites, spiders, scorpions, ticks, snakes, uh, we don't incise the bite or suck the poison out or anything like that. Um, just keeping the patient calm, a little cold compress to the site. Now we'll go a long way. Get a detailed history, including uh, trying to ID the scorpion, um, IV access, and in the event you need to give something for pain and transport. Ticks, um, ticks disseminate diseases like uh, Rocky Mounted spot, Spotted Fever, uh, Lyme's disease are all tick-borne illnesses. Um, ticks can cause tick paralysis. Uh, uh, treatment is, um, you first have to identify that that was uh, the cause. Uh, early Lyme's disease resembles stroke, and uh, a person may not know that they have uh, been bitten by a deer tick and have contracted Lyme's disease until they start to have some sort of neurologic deficits, and um, uh, oftentimes it goes unnoticed as Lyme's, and um, is diagnosed as you know potential mild stroke, um, unless of course 
um, you know, you're in an area where uh, tick-borne illnesses are, are common. Pit vipers include copperheads in these parts, um, rattlesnakes, water moccasins. Uh, signs and symptoms are going to be fang marks at the, at the envenomation site, local swelling, a lot of pain. Uh, they may become weak, sweaty, nausea and vomiting, may have some uh, numbness and tingling in the extremity, swelling of the extremity, bruising of the extremity, and in severe cases, shock. Treatment is going to be uh, supportive uh, as far as uh, starting with the scene safety, uh, making sure that the, the snake is uh, still not present, or if it is, that it's it's not alive. <laughs> you don't want to get uh, bit yourself. Uh, supporting the airway, breathing, and circulation, get a good history, trying to ID the snake, um, you know, IVO2 monitor, clean the wound, uh, immobilize the extremity, keep the patient calm to uh, decrease the spread of the venom, and again, as I mentioned, we don't incise the wound and suck it out. So here are some different types of snakes, uh, certainly the rattler up there on the left, um, and uh, uh, the other two there. And you can see with the mouth open in that one on the top right, uh, you can see the fangs tucked back behind the head. Um, and venomation is not very common. Uh, the snake has to really get a hold of a fleshy piece of your body, uh, like the back of your calf. Um, uh, or a soft part of your arm in order to sink their teeth into it uh, and squeeze those venom sacs uh, to envenomate you. So the vast majority of snake bites, even though they're painful, um, not much venom, if any, is injected. Uh, coral snakes um, it can be deadly. Um, and there's a little uh, black on yellow kills a fellow. Um, so as you can see with the bands here that uh, you've got two yellow bands on either side of the black. Um, and so that would ID this snake as being uh, deadly. And uh, envenomation from a coral snake includes slurred speech, dilated pupils, difficulty um, uh, swallowing, uh, paralysis, and respiratory failure from the paralysis. Treatment is, uh, you know, again, making sure the scene is safe, uh, being supportive of any life threats in the ABCs, get a good history, try to identify the black on yellow, uh, clean the wound, immobilize the extremity to decrease the spread of the uh, venom uh, and rapid transport uh, to a facility for some anti-venom. As far as marine creatures go, we're talking about jellyfish, Portuguese men of war, uh, stingrays, lionfish, sea, urchin, sea urchins, sea anemones, fire coral, cone snails, blue ringed octopi, and nematocysts. And uh, these uh, marine creatures all have different defense mechanisms to protect themselves. Uh, you know, certainly some will. Um, uh, they have poison in their barbs or they uh, have poison in their tentacles uh, and when you come in contact with them uh, you can be envenomated. Signs and symptoms of marine creature uh, poisoning include intense local pain, redness and swelling, uh, maybe lacerations if you're talking about the barb or the whip uh, from a uh, uh, stingray. Um, uh, nausea and vomiting, weakness, uh, shortness of breath, tachycardia, hypotension, shock, and a potential death. Um, treatment is going to be supportive. Try to get a good, high, a good history and, if possible, ID the type of marine creature that uh, caused the, the problem. Uh, if, if possible, remove stinging cells or spines. Uh, apply high heat uh, and, um, you know, uh, there's all kinds of uh, certain wives' tales out there about uh, meat tenderizer, uh, urine, uh, vinegar. Um, we do know that uh, acidity does um, decrease uh, the effect of some of these toxins from these sea creatures. And so that's why the suggestion was uh, uh, um, vinegar. Um, um, salt water enhances 
<coughs> the spread of the venom, so make sure to use clean water. And again, if you have if you have vinegar, uh, that certainly would help. And here are some different uh, sea creatures with the uh, you know the bottom left hand, you know, just blending right into the floor of the uh, of the ocean. You can only see the top of its head, and you could easily step on it, and it could barb you. Um, and there's a man of war, Portuguese man of war in the top left. But the jellyfish don't have to be huge. I mean, I was in Mobile, Alabama, walking along the shore in the, in the evening, and I could see all these little ultraviolet uh, things, um, you know, lighting up in the water, and, and they were extremely small, you know, smaller than a pencil lead. And so you're walking in the water, enjoying the evening, and not much happened at that point, but you know, within a couple hours, you, you know, you've got a huge nasty rash around your ankles and your feet uh, where these uh, these little creatures stung the heck out of you. And again, here's some other uh, sea creatures, whether it be um, jellyfish or uh, stepping on the barb of a, uh, a fish that's laying on the bottom of the, uh, of the ocean, uh, and then an octopi um, under a rock there. Foods, plants, and mushrooms certainly can cause poisoning as well. Uh, salmonella is one sort of food poisoning that a person can get. And, and when somebody gets the true food poisoning, within minutes they are sick. And I mean, they are really sick. Um, you know, they're vomiting forcefully. They have a forceful diarrhea. Uh, they can become really dehydrated in a short period of time from all the vomiting and uh, diarrhea. Um, somebody who eats something and, um, you know, 12, 14 hours later, they have a little diarrhea and they go, oh, that food didn't agree with me. But more than likely, the food had a little higher bacteria count than, um, you know, than what your body uh, would normally accept. And so that's why it's trying to get rid of it. Um, but that isn't true food poisoning. Uh, botulinium, um, botulinium is, uh, 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 poisoning from, uh, improperly preserved or canned foods. Um, uh, these spores are resistant to heat. Um, uh, botulism, uh, is the disease caused by botulinium. And botulinium was actually uh, considered to uh, be produced as a, a biological weapon, a weapon of mass destruction, because uh, one, there is no antidote, and and uh, botulism is uh, one of the deadliest. Botulinium is one of the dead deadliest um, poisons known to man. Um, very similar to um, you want to say Botox. Um, Botox is botulinium toxin that is injected into the face or around the face in very, very small amounts that will kill and paralyze the um, the nerves, uh, which then releases the wrinkles in the face. Uh, and uh, I just can't imagine somebody getting <laughs> an injection of a lethal uh, toxin in their face and how that could uh, go terribly wrong. Signs and symptoms, severe CNS effects, head to toe paralysis, respiratory arrest, quadriplegia. It is a really, really nasty um, food poisoning. There was a, a canning factory back in the 80s, I think it was either green beans, um, where uh, they, uh, their process had been flawed and they unfortunately put out hundreds of cans of green beans that contain botulism, and uh, as a result, many people got sick. Uh, treatment's going to be supportive, uh, and because the primary um, presentation of botulism is respiratory arrest or head-to-toe paralysis, uh, then supporting the uh, ventilations is going to be very important. Uh, you know, there's so many different plants and uh, garden variety mushrooms, and that are out there in your your yards and uh, and children particularly may chew on the leaf uh, pets may chew on the leaf uh, you know those sort of things and all our drugs come from plants um, so there are you know certainly those that are aware of the medicinal effects of certain roots and leaves and plants in the wild uh, and may chew on those 
um, to soothe their stomach or regulate their heart rate or some of those other things, but there's no, in those situations, there's no known dose and you don't know how much you're getting and uh, there's no quality assurance and any of those other things that go into producing the actual pill forms from these plants. So plant and mushroom ingestion can cause um, uh, certainly gastrointestinal upset, uh, can cause uh, rashes. Um, uh, they may include oxalate containing substances. Uh, they may include cy cyanogenic glycosides. So they may include cyanide in uh, cardiac glycosides. Now, Purple Fox Glove includes the cardiac uh, glycoside um, digitalis. Um, and digitalis is very important in treating uh, atrial fib, atrial flutter. Uh, solanine is a chemical that's found primarily in green potatoes, uh, and it can be deadly if uh, a person eats enough of it. Uh, so, you know, in those situations where you're seeing uh, potatoes that have a green skin or a green meat, uh, you, you don't want to eat that. Uh, Aminitia and a gallerina um, are a, a genus of uh, mushrooms uh, that may be found in the um, garden variety sort of thing. Um, they include uh, inocybe, clidocybe uh, mushrooms. Um, in people who are inexperienced in mushroom hunting, uh, they may um, uh, mistake these mushrooms in the wild or in the yard that resemble the mushrooms you'd put on a pizza or grill on the grill, uh, like a portabella, um, but in fact they are uh, toxic uh, and most of them are uh, anticholinergic. So when you consume these uh, mushrooms, then um, uh, you have an anticholinergic toxidrome. Uh, signs and symptoms of plants and mushroom ingestion include redness, irritation at the contact site. Examine the mouth for redness, irritation, swelling, and blistering. There could be some excessive salivation and lacrimation, some sweating, some nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea, uh, altered mental status, and coma. <coughs> supportive uh, is the, uh, you know, being supportive of the ABCs is the treatment. Try to obtain a good history to see if they've been exposed to a particular plant or mushroom. Try to identify that if you can and call poison control. Uh, alcohol abuse, um, we know that ethanol is a potent CNS depressant. Uh, we know that ethanol consumption is widely accepted in uh, all of the world. In one variety or another, if it's not in the form of beers, it might be in the form of wines. Um, you know, wines made from honey, wines made from grapes, wines made from rice, beer made from rice, beer made from hops, grains, those sort of things. Um, but uh, alcohol dependence uh, can lead to uh, coma and death uh, if you have alcohol poisoning, ETOH poisoning. Um, it is said that somebody who um, uh, can't handle their liquor, uh, or drinks to intoxication every time they consume uh, is an alcoholic. And uh, alcoholism, um, the definition and the, um, the acceptance of the disease uh, has uh, really improved over the last two decades. Um, anymore, there's... Uh, you know, scientific evidence that would show that a true alcoholic has uh, somewhat of an allergy or has a certain effect not seen in other people when they consume alcohol. Um, and because of that, um, they have, uh, they have a physiologic addiction to the alcohol where the vast majority of people who are termed alcoholics, uh, that's more a behavioral um, issue where it's a learned behavior, um, perhaps early in life, and um, 
uh, it's a habit that certainly can be broken, um, but is not a true physiologic addiction to the drug itself as much as it is a, a, a just a learned behavior. Uh, some signs that you might be dependent on alcohol includes drinking every day. Um, uh, the patient may have the odor of alcohol on them, their face may be flushed, they may do binge drinking, and, and binge drinking has a, a variety of different definitions as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's widely known that, uh, you know, a couple beers or a couple glasses of wine a day uh, can have some health benefits. Um, but binge drinking refers to perhaps not drinking anything for several days and then going out and, and uh, uh, drinking to uh, excess uh, to the point where you become, um, you know, um, uh, obviously intoxicated. And the problem with binge drinking is that it can lead to um, pancreatitis. And the pancreatitis may not show up right away. Uh, it may show up days after the binge. Um, uh, certainly, if you can't remember the events of the night before uh, and you have periods of time in your life that have been blacked out while drinking, um, you know, that's a good sign of alcohol abuse. Uh, if you fall down a lot, uh, if you've got a lot of GI problems um, with ulcers and uh, those sort of things, and then uh, obviously uh, liver involvement uh, or any signs of elevated liver functions, um, you know, those sort of things indicating damage to the liver itself. Withdrawal from uh, alcohol or any illegal drug for that matter, the withdrawal, if it occurs too quickly, can be potentially lethal. Uh, people go through delirium tremens, they go through ataxia, uh, hyperthermia, uh, can have grand mal seizures, and uh, can go into respiratory arrest. Uh, signs and symptoms of withdrawal symptoms then include uh, anxiety, irritability, tremors, nausea and vomiting, uh, weakness, sweatiness, hallucinations, tachycardia, hypertension with, uh, with possible orthostatic hypotension and uh, not being able to sleep. Um, you know, we still have patients today that, that we must admit to our mental health unit, but we can't put them in our... Uh, mental health unit if they're intoxicated. So if they come in intoxicated, we have to detox them first. And that's something that occurs, you know, slowly over time. Uh, you don't want to rapidly withdraw uh, somebody from their drug of choice, whether it be alcohol or some other drug. Uh, treatment is supportive, manage life threats in the ABCs, get a good patient history, determine what other drugs they're on. Um, if they have seizures, diazepam or some sort of benzodiazepine for the seizures would be good. Uh, IV access, heart monitor, those sort of things. Uh, make sure the scene is safe and uh, transport. Uh, amphetamines or methamphetamines, signs and symptoms, uh, everything is going to be up uh, with amphetamines. Uh, they're going to act like a sympathomimetic. Uh, there's going to be exhilaration and hyperactivity, dilated pupils, hypertension, tremors, seizures, uh, and psychosis. Amphetamine treatment is uh, supportive, ABCs, uh, IVO2 monitor, uh, and uh, you may need to um, treat the uh, cardiac conditions that you find. And an example there is that, uh, you know, somebody who takes methamphetamines because it does accelerate your heart rate and those sort of things that uh, a person with marginal heart disease and you really start working their heart with amphetamine or methamphetamine, um, then they may have an acute coronary syndrome. They may also suffer from coronary artery vasospasm and have a STEMI. Um, if they do have seizures, certainly treatment for seizures using some sort of benzodiazepine and then rapid transport. Um, high doses of amphetamines will cause seizures, hallucinations, uh, paranoia, and psychosis. Withdrawal symptoms, when somebody's coming off of uh, amphetamines, uh, they'll be lethargic, uh, depressed, they'll have suicidal tendencies, and uh, coma. 
Cocaine is a CNS stimulant as well. A lethal, lethal dose of cocaine is if it's more than 1,200 milligrams. Uh, it comes in a powder form, uh, comes in a free base form. The free base form you can obtain by taking powder and heating it till it melts into a liquid uh, and then inject that liquid into your bloodstream. Signs and symptoms include euphoria, and that's why most people do cocaine, because of how euphoric it makes you feel, um, hyperactivity, dilated pupils, psychosis, anxiety, hypertension, hyperthermia, uh, dysrhythmias, uh, chest pain, uh, coronary artery vasospasm, and uh, seizures. Treatment is going to be supportive. Um, IVO2 monitor, uh, and again, uh, cardiac treatment uh, should they exhibit any signs of an acute coronary syndrome and then uh, seizure treatment uh, with some sort of benzodiazepine and then rapid transport. It's also important to keep in mind that uh, people who take amphetamines, methamphetamines, cocaine, uh, because they are stimulants and they get everything going, um, that we uh, not only try to bring them down um, with uh, uh, you know something like a benzodiazepine, even if they're not having seizures. Uh, so in these patients who are uh, really uh, agitated or delirious, uh, we're going to consider giving them something uh, for that agitation or delirious like, like a benzodiazepine, even if they're not having a seizure. Opioids, which include heroin, uh, all the uh, morphine and codeine derivatives, uh, Darvon, Darvacet, per Percodan, Percocet, all of those, Oxycontin, um, they're in the opioids group. Uh, they are CNS depressants. They cause respiratory failure. Uh, they can be taken orally, uh, intravascular, intradermally, absorbed through the skin. Uh, they can be smoked. Uh, they can be done in speed balls. Um, in any event, uh, the ingestion of heroin is on the rise, and uh, we're seeing more and more um, heroin overdoses and the reason for that is that it's becoming harder and harder to get morphine, codeine and their derivatives uh, so the cost of uh, heroin is much less than the cost of um, uh, its counterparts um, so uh, heroin is being more widely used. The signs and symptoms are going to include uh, uh, euphoria and then the classic presentation uh, CNS depression, respiratory dep depression, and pinpoint pupils. They may be hypotensive, bradycardic, pulmonary edema, and coma, but it's that classic triad of CNS depression, respiratory depression, and pinpoint pupils that leads you to believe you're dealing with an opioid or a sedative. <clears throat> Methamphetamine, uh, here they're talking about the clandestine labs, and um, the labs may be a lethal risk of anybody, depending upon what they're using to cook their meth <coughs> and the methodology they're using to cook their meth. <clears throat> you know, some of the early methods involved uh, all kinds of nasty, harsh, ham harmful chemicals uh, that were used to separate the methamphetamine from the Sudafed, and then you had to dry that liquid out, uh, and so they would apply heat to it, uh, and the heat eventually would dry it out. Um, but because of the explosive nature of all the white gas and and uh, all the other things that they put into their mix, explosions were common. Uh, so then they figured out a way to cook the meth in about half the time using anhydrous ammonia because of anhydrous' strong affinity to water. Um, they would make their slurry, they'd put anhydrous ammonia with it, and it would uh, consume all the water, leaving them with crystal. And there was no fire, there was no heat, there was no explosions. Uh, and now they've gotten so bold and, and, and certainly uh, so much better at production of their product that um, uh, they do what's called a shake and bake. They put a few chemicals in a, um, uh, a Mountain Dew jug, uh, just a standard you know, uh, 16 ounce, 20 ounce, 24 ounce um, uh, thing of Mountain Dew, and they uh, put all their chemicals in there, put their Sudafed in there, shake it up, and 45 minutes later they got meth. Um, it is a potent CNS stimulant. Uh, it causes a, a tremendous euphoria, 
um, that uh, immediately burns the dopamine receptors in your brain. Um, not all of them, but burns some of them out. So you'll never get that same high. And many people who take methamphetamine get hooked because they're, they keep trying, to, they're chasing that initial high they had, uh, which they'll never get again. Uh, a methamphetamine user is called a tweaker. <clears throat> they tweak. Uh, they usually haven't slept for three to ten days because everything's up. When they're on meth, they're jacked. Um, they're irritable, they're unpredictable, they're dangerous for EMS. Uh, the the uh, methamphetamine causes euphoria, sleeplessness, invincibility, uh, keen hyperactive senses, and uh, hyperactive intelligence, really. <laughs> you wouldn't think so because they're doing meth. Um, signs and symptoms include euphoria, muscle tremors, insomnia, depression, hypertension, chest pain, and stroke. Hallucination, psychosis, anxiety, and anorexia. The thing to keep in mind about uh, these methamphetamines is that uh, oftentimes these patients are belligerent uh, and may become delirious, uh, in which case law enforcement has to be called and they have to be tased. And there's a struggle. And in the in-custody struggle, um, uh, the person may develop uh, agitated delirium and die. Um, so we have to be aware that, that when we're dealing with these people and we know that they're in this super heightened state of awareness and um, uh, maybe really hypertensive, uh, may, may already have a, quite a load um, on their heart and then uh, if they have to be restrained and they struggle and that sort of thing, it just increases the uh, likelihood of them going into cardiac arrest. Um, so treatment is going to be uh, scene safety, uh, manage immediate life threats, and of course the immediate life threats on methamphetamine, like with cocaine, uh, uh, and any stimulant is going to be, um, you know, checking out their cardiovascular system, make sure they're not, uh, you know, running rates of 200, that sort of thing. IBO2 monitor, um, consider any treating any sort of uh, cardiac arrhythmias that you find, uh, as you would all cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and then um, should they have seizures, um, benzodiazepine to treat the seizures. Uh, and these patients usually require tons of benzodiazepines if they're agitated or delirious. Uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 milligrams of Valium. Uh, and then um, rapid transport. MDA, ecstasy, it's right in the exact same class as um, the uh, amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine. So it's going to have all the similar effects of uh, those uh, drugs as well. Uh, again, the euphoria, uh, but in uh, larger amounts, confusion, agitation, hyperthermia, diarrhea. And treatment is going to be supportive, supporting the ABCs, uh, IBO2 monitor, and uh, again, should this cause uh, any sort of uh, Q-coronary syndrome, managing that appropriately, and uh, lots of benzodiazepines to calm these folks down, uh, cool them off if they're really hot, and uh, rapid transport. Uh, Rohypnol is a, a common date, date, date rape drug. Uh, it's called Rufi's. Um, Rohypnol can come in a liquid form, um, and in its liquid form, it is tasteless, odorless, colorless, and can easily be slipped into a drink and go unnoticed. Um, and typically, the consequences of ingesting Rohypnol uh, don't have to do with any sort of, um, you know, medical problems like you see with opioids and like you see with with um, cocaine and those sort of things. Um, but because it is a date rape drug, uh, the consequence of ingestion of this drug usually uh, involves sexual abuse. So you'll, you'll need law enforcement involved and uh, it's not uncommon to um, you know be called to uh, transport a patient who uh, wakes up uh, after being at a party and uh, their bra is missing or their clothes are on backwards and they don't remember anything but they are certain that they've been sexually molested or abused uh, and so uh, they may call an ambulance for that. 
Hallu uh, hallucinogens uh, include things like the uh, uh, phenylcyclidine, uh, they include uh, PCP, they include um, um, oh, psilocybin, peyote, uh, LSD, PCP, all those sort of things are considered hallucinogens. And uh, they're going to give you a state of euphoria. And if you look at, you know, the number one bullet point in many of these medications, these illegal drugs that people are abusing, uh, the number one sign and symptom is euphoria. Uh, in other words, in, in, in the right amount, um, these drugs uh, make a person feel extremely good. Uh, good about the world, good about themselves, good about their life. Um, and as a result, that's why they're attractive, because of the euphoria. Um, but with hallucinogens, you can be disoriented, confused, sudden mood shifts, flushing, diaphoresis, hypersalivation, vomiting. Pupils could be reactive, facial grimacing, nystigmus, involuntary eye movement. Um, they may be hallucinating as well. Um, and in that particular situation, you don't want to participate in it. In higher doses, CNS depression, coma, respiratory depression, hypertension, tachycardia, and cephalopathy refers to a, a swelling of the brain, uh, some sort of uh, brain pathology, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, and uh, seizures. All right, so uh, that takes us through the uh, toxicology 2 part of our uh, uh, a chapter. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and end the uh, lecture. And um, uh, we will uh, see you soon when we talk about uh, hematology. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, thank you.